and that's why you're here. We won't be showing clips today because we want to maximize all of our time with Anna, as you can imagine. And there might be spoilers, so look out. And with that, I'm going to turn it to Jack to tell you more about Anna and ask us our first set of questions. Thank you, Holly, and thank you, Anna. Um, it's a pleasure to be with all of you this morning. Um, Anna, I think I speak for many of us on the call that uh, watching Unorthodox has been a comfort and silver lining of this uh, wretched uh, pandemic. I know you didn't plan it that way, but, uh, but thanks for giving us all something to sort of reflect on and, and to sort of dive into. Um, I wanted to start our questions this morning to help those on the call learn a little bit about your background. Um, you were raised in Massachusetts and uh, Kenya, and uh, you now live in Berlin. But given the subject material, and given that our hosts uh, are the Westchester Jewish Center in Westchester County, New York, can you start by giving us a little bit of a grounding in your Jewish background? So um, my parents are, just to clarify my upbringing, my parents are anthropologists. Um, they're professors at Harvard. So I, I, I'm from Massachusetts, more or less. but we were often living in the places where they were doing research, which at the beginning was in Africa, and after that was in Mexico. Um, and my, my mother is from England and my father is from New York. And so my father's background is like fairly typical Polish immigrant, you know, shtetl, Eastern European experience. All of my grandparents spoke Yiddish, uh, although, um, I don't speak it. I feel like I speak it now just because of the whole experience of making the show, but I don't actually speak it. My father, you know, I live in Germany now. So when my father sort of uses Yiddish to understand German, but he's not, he doesn't really speak it himself either, but he, his parents did. Right. So, you know, on that side, um, whereas my mother's family, um, is German. I mean, Jewish, but but from all from Hamburg and Bremen originally, and um, no one on that side of the family spoke Yiddish. So it's kind of a di they're from different. Um, my parents are from really different backgrounds, and they met in Africa, uh, as anthropologists do. <laughs> so you know that's what happened. <laughs> um, so I'm a product of a kind of unusual combination of of people, and I, and you know where I grew up uh, in Boston. You know, there was a lot of, I think about this a lot now, and I did while we were making the show, because there was a lot of people who had been refugees from Europe, who were the kind of elders in, in the community I grew up in around the university. Um, there were a lot of people who'd been even in the, kin not a lot, but like, let's say certain friends of my parents who'd been in the kinder transport had, had been in England and then had come to America later. Um, and I really strongly associated German accents with my parents' older friends. I mean, you know, this all predates my, my living in Germany. You know, I had no association, no positive associations with Germany at all. And, um, and, but, and yet I really thought of a German accent as being kind of a Jewish thing. So, I mean, just to give you some orientation for my, you know, coming to this material, because, you know, I make another TV show uh, that has nothing to do with anything Jewish that's on Hulu and Amazon that's um, called Deutschland 83. And it's, it's a Cold War spy show that is uh, set, it's about an East German spy who's undercover in the West. And um, I write it in English, but we shoot it in mostly in German. And, uh, you know, every, it, some, on some level, this seems very different. On, on other levels, I would say it's not actually that different. There's certain things it has in common. But I would say that this project uh, brought together many different parts of my experience and of it kind of grew out of the experience of being Jewish in Germany um, and the conversations I was having with certain people in my life, including Deborah Feldman, who wrote the book and who is a mother at school. So our kids go to school together where they take religion at school. Um, and so our kids take Jewish studies, obviously, but they, they, it's part of like the national curriculum is to take religion, which is of course really different from the United States. So you can choose which religion, but they do take it in school, which for us, all of us as Americans at the beginning was kind of surprising. Um, 
and they and they take Jewish studies in German, which I also found surprising at the beginning. I have experienced that as a disconnect. Um, but you know, we I would say our children in particular, but also our general community here in Berlin are part of a kind of revival. I mean, revival sounds like something different than it is. There's, there's actually, a, I guess my point is, there are really a lot of Jewish people living here. So, and they're from all kinds of, many are Israeli, many are American, um, but it doesn't feel as weird as it probably sounds to you, if you haven't been here. But there was definitely a desire on my part uh, to speak to that unusual condition, uh, this kind of doubling back on history. And so, um, I collaborated on creating the show with a friend of mine who's a documentary filmmaker, and she would be here too, but it's, she lives in LA and it's 7 a.m. Uh, and she has twins who are newborn, so I felt like I couldn't ask her to do this. Um, but she, uh, she made a film that I sent to Holly, who she, that Holly, you watched it, didn't you? Isn't it like the best movie ever? Fabulous. Yeah. Very lucky to have seen it. Um, it's about her grandmother and her grandmother's best friend who lived together when they were in their 90s in Berlin. And so her name is Alexa Karolinski and her family are descended from a whole group of Polish uh, Jewish uh, refugees who were in a DP camp <clears throat> outside Berlin after they had been as teenagers um, in the labor camps and in, in concentration camps. So they were sort of brought together into this large DP camp in the north of the city and ended up staying here. It was about a thousand people. Um, and sort of Alexa grew up, her, it was her grandmother and grandfather who were from that community, who, who, rather who had come to Berlin to the DP camps and everybody in her community she grew up with here in Berlin were, were descendants of that group of people. And um, so through knowing her, through seeing her work, she had made a series of documentaries that reflect on her family experience of being Jewish in Germany, like being a native German Jew, which is something that, you know, where I grew up, German Jews were people who had been refugees to America and then still had German accents, but lived in Cambridge, you know? Um, but I, and, and of course my mother's family, but like they had already gone to England, you know, by the 1880s or something. Whereas, you know, Alexa was one of the first people I ever met who was actually a German Jew, like right now. And that was a big part of the conversation that we've always had. And so anyway, working with her was, was a lot of fun because it kind of grew out of a dialogue that we we're already having around these issues of identity, of assimilation, of, of how you live in a place where you know so many terrible things have happened, um, or you, how you live in a place where you know terrible things would have happened to you. Um, how we sort of deal with the, how the legacy of the Holocaust. And the thing about that drew both of us to the material, uh, to Deborah's story was one, I mean, not just that we're friends with her, that it's a very compulsively readable book, but also that the Satmar community in Williamsburg is, um, you know, it was founded by Holocaust survivors and who, who believed that they had been punished by God for assimilating and that, that they were attempting to live a most pious life um, in order to prevent bad things from happening again. And I, I found that very moving when I understood that. And, um, and, you know, also sort of the impulse to have so many children to rebuild the six million lost I just all of that. I thought I, it was something that gave me another level of understanding, you know, to people that who I had, you know, I'd lived in New York for years. I went to Columbia. I was used to be a photographer. So I had quite a bit to do with Hasidic men because they run all of the businesses around um, photography. But I, I had had nothing to do with uh, uh, Satmar women, but quite a bit to do with men. And um, you know, I, I, I just, when I read her book, I, it gave me a, a really different level of empathy for what they're doing or what the project, like what they're up to. You know, I hadn't really understood it. And we felt that it was an interesting opportunity to kind of examine um, the, this sort of constellation of, of ideas.
So, so Anna, the, you bring up the book and uh, some on the Zoom call have probably read it and heard of it um, and others may not have. So Holly, in the vein of assuming uh, that some may not have, can you help ground us in the book because it was so important uh, to the development of the, the series? Anna, do you want to answer that question? Because oh, sure. I'd also love to know about its impact on you and when you decided to take it from book to screen. Yeah, so, so the book was written and was published in 2012. It's the story of Deborah's life. Um, she was raised by her grandparents in the community. Her parents, her mother had left and her father uh, was, uh, had certain problems. So he was unable, I think he wouldn't have been able, allowed to raise her anyway. So her mother uh, left the community. Her father did not raise her. She was raised instead by her grandparents who were survivors themselves who, who had already raised 10 kids or something like that and sort of found themselves raising a child uh, long after the fact, after the others were grown up. Oh, the, the movie, it's not a movie, it's actually a TV series, I'm answering the question. Uh, it's called Unorthodox and it's on Netflix. And the book is also called Unorthodox, just to answer the question that someone just asked. Um, so, the book is really the story of her life. A lot of the book actually has to do with her childhood, um, which. I'll, I'll talk to you. You're a doll. Thank you. I'm on. Oh, that movie. Oh, sorry. Yeah, the documentary that Alexa made is called Oma and Bella. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's that's <laughs> that's the documentary about the two grandmothers in Berlin, which is so good. Um, and, um, but just about Unorthodox, the book. Um, uh, so basically, let's say that I, we were really interested in the character. So first of all, Deborah and I know each other from school. She suggested that I make a TV show of the book. I don't normally work uh, on adaptations. I usually make things up from scratch. So for me, it was hard in a way to enter the material with the idea of having to be faithful to the book. But she said, you know, that she would give me the creative freedom to kind of uh, break it apart, and make something new out of it. So um, Alexa and I uh, adapted it together and we, and we decided to focus on the marriage because we, um, so effectively in the, in the story, in the TV show, we, the parts that are from the book are the parts about the marriage and about the past and everything from the moment she leaves her husband, we made up. And um, there was a couple of reasons we did that. One, because you know, a, a memoir, because the book is a memoir, it is very internal and isn't, you know, you need to activate much more to make a TV show. You know, things on screen are, are really different from they, like books that can take place in basically in your head. Um, but also, um, because, you know, Deborah is still a really young woman. She's 33. She um, is quite famous in Germany. She has, she's a sort of public intellectual here. And we, we just didn't think it was appropriate for the present day of the story to, to be too close to anything um, about her real life. So we kind of took the liberty to make up everything else. And we also activated her husband as a character. He's not a character in the book. And we made up the character of Moisha, who's the guy who helps um, her husband track her down in Berlin. So, I mean, Deborah Feldman, in fact, lives in Berlin, but she, in this, in the book, if you read it, there was like a four year period between when she left the community and when she moved to Berlin. So as we've organized it, she came here directly. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a combination of fact and fiction. I would say more fiction than fact, um, but it's definitely inspired by her story. And, um, and we sort of merged that with the conversations we were having about post-war Berlin. Can you sort of take us a little bit into the pitch to Netflix? Uh, a lot of us have seen Stiesel, uh, some of us have seen Fauda. Um, how does all that sort of come together and, and, and how, what was the pitch and how was it received initially? Well, I had been talking with Netflix about doing something together for a while, like just more generally, you know, they would always come into my office and hang out and, you know, they're American, I am too. And, you know, I was making this other show that's really popular, uh, 
on Amazon stuff. So they, they liked the idea of working together and so did I, but um, we were always trying to find a project that would, that we could shoot in Berlin because, you know, I have kids, you know, I, there's all kinds of things that we talked about that required a lot of traveling and I, I didn't want to do that. <laughs> um, so um, then when I had, when this idea sort of was started to percolate, you know, the, the big issue with this project was that we would only have done it if we could do it in Yiddish. And we were not prepared to do this in English or in German. I mean, it would have been really weird. So I basically said to them, like, I've got an idea. We could do uh, this and in Yiddish. And, and there was no response. I mean, this is, believe me, it's not an easy sell. <laughs> um, but then to their credit, they just kind of got behind it. Like, like a month later, they were like, you know what, fine. If you can deliver this by the end of 2019, then we'll just, then let's do it. And they got psyched about it and they'd never tried to really influence it. You know, they were very um, encouraging and they were excited about it. And Stizzle came out while we, or it came out in 2013, but we hadn't seen it till it was on Netflix. And that was like, I think it came out like in maybe November 18 when we, all I know is that I saw it in the winter when, before, because, you know, our star is on Stizzle, right? Shira Haas. And I had not seen Stizzle till soon before we did casting in Israel. So it must have come on to Netflix like the fall of 2018. And um, I watched some of it, but it's very different from our show. And I mean, I like it, but it's just something else. You know, it's much more, first of all, it's Israeli, right? Which already feels really different. It's like a really different, you know, her ready communities are, are still different from that more, but also it's, it's not expressionistic the way our show is, you know, it's not kind of, you know, we feel that you're seeing the world through Esty's eyes, you know, you're seeing how she sees Williamsburg, how it feels to her, and you're seeing Berlin, how it feels to her too. Um, and that's, that was deliberate on our part, you know, we were, we were going for a kind of expressionist cinema uh, way of approaching the material. Um, Stizel is much more, not banal, but it, it's, it's like, it's much more about sort of, um, I'll take Lish, like normal life in a way that's really beautiful. So we, we found it interesting, but we weren't, I just, it's funny because people keep asking if we had watched a lot of things that were about Hasidic, the Hasidic world in general um, beforehand. And we did watch a few things. Most of it, we didn't feel really related to what we were doing, except this one film called Fill the Void, which is an Israeli movie, which we all loved. And if you haven't seen it, um, I can really end it something very reduced and special about it and dramatic about it. Um, but Fauda, well, I know everybody who makes Fauda because my other show, Deutsch, is more related to Fauda, I would say, <laughs> um, because it's about people on two sides of a wall. It's about, it's, I've, I've often been on panels with the guys who make Fauda. Uh, for that reason. So I guess I didn't think that Fauda had much to do with this. I mean, one thing you have to understand about Netflix, if you're interested just in the kind of television world aspect of this, is that um, what the miracle of Netflix is that I, what would otherwise seem to be a real niche project um, drops in 192 countries at the same time. So that means that global niche is a lot more people than niche, national niche, right? So I think that that gives them, they're well organized to make a show like this, that, that <clears throat> if we were to make it for national television, I don't know, in Germany where we're located, you know, a tiny fraction of people would, would be interested in it. And that would be, it would amount to, I don't know, a million people or something, but it wouldn't be a big audience. But if you add up all the niche people interested in this all over the world, it's, it's kind of an astonishing number. So I think that Ted Sarandos, who runs Netflix, really gets that. I mean, he was going to explain that to me, that like, um, you know, if you increase the trade radius of a niche idea, then you've got, that's a lot of people. So I think that's, that's, awesome. that's the Netflix part of it. And I think that's true about Fauda also. Tell us some of the, about some of the choices you made in the writing room and, and on the set about that, that helped make the production authentic in terms of the depi its depiction of the Satmar and Jewish Well, the culture. first person, I mean, for Alexa and 
I, we made a, we made a couple of important decisions going into the project. One was that we were going to shoot it in Yiddish. One was that we were only going to cast Jewish actors to play the Jewish characters. Um, that might sound crazy to you all because you live in America and most Jewish characters are not played by Jewish actors in American TV. But then again, there's a lot more Jews involved in making those projects in, in American TV. Whereas in Germany, there is a real tradition of course of telling Jewish stories because a lot of the work on television and in cinema is um, about German history and German history dovetails with Jewish history, right? So that you can't really separate those two at a certain, you know, they see it as German history and it is also German history, but it, it is also Jewish history, right? So it's like, it, there's a lot of projects that have been made here that involve, that are about Jewish characters that involve no Jews either behind the camera or in front of the camera. So we, we wanted to sort of make a statement that was different. We, we felt going into it that, that that was kind of a, that was important to us, not politically, but sort of culturally. But there's another issue, which is that because we were shooting it in Yiddish and so few people speak Yiddish, we felt that in a, from a casting point of view, the, the options were basically we, um, we either hire people who can speak it, which is basically we're talking about ex-Satmar people because very few people grew up speaking Yiddish who are young now. Um, or we have people who have at least, at, the, at a minimum, a feeling for the language because their grandparents spoke it, you know, or they've been exposed to it. So that was the additional reason for, for hiring Jewish actors um, uh, so there was, that was one thing. And then the second thing we did was hire this amazing guy named Ellie Rosen, who is just like the best. Um, he was our Yiddish translator, our cultural coach. Um, our, he coached the actors in the Yiddish, which was not a small task. And he translated the scripts and he also played the rabbi. And he's from Borough Park. He's not from Williamsburg, but he's really a linguist. He was raised, uh, Hasidic and he left uh, in his mid 30s. So he was a cantor. He also has an incredible singing voice. He sings in the show. I mean, he's, he's like, he can do everything. And he's also really a pleasure to have around. And he was just a lot of fun to work with. And he moved to Berlin for the duration of the um, project. So, you know, he was a huge part of it. But in addition, we had quite a few Satmar actors who were working with us, right? So there was a very healthy debate about everything. Like um, the length of the socks, are the socks white or white, are the white or the black? You know, these guys could get into massive debates about every detail and we tried really hard to get the details right. But we kept joking that like, you know, if you ask all 10 of them, everybody gives you a different answer. So we were at a certain, we're gonna get this right, you know, like no matter what, we're gonna disappoint somebody um, because it's a highly detail-oriented community, and there's uh, all kinds of debates around, especially clothes. And I got certain things wrong. I, I mean, I'm aware of what we got wrong, um, of course. Uh, people never hesitate to tell you what you got wrong, but I think we did get a lot of things right. And um, having Ellie around, you know, one detail that he told in an interview, which I thought was really great, um, has to do with the wedding which is, you know, in terms of what they say at the wedding and how, what portion of the ceremony that you see, um, we showed, I mean, that was, the, the Satmar weddings or Hasidic weddings are very long and we obviously couldn't have the whole thing. We had like six minutes or something on screen. So we chose the parts that we felt were most important, um, but we, we refrained from the w one detail that would have made them actually married. So there, there were just certain things in what they're saying and how the prayers are told and how, you know, and Ellie was very careful with things like that. You know, he didn't want us to actually marry these people. So you, you just, it was, we were elliptical about it and you don't see the thing that would have made them actually married. You see what I mean? Um, not because we're superstitious, but because we felt it was disrespectful. We wanted to be respectful. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
that's fascinating. I want to return to the subject of Berlin. You live there, you've referenced it. It, it. it strikes me that Berlin isn't just the setting of the series, but but also uh, a character in its own right. Um, it, 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 it evokes the, the Holocaust, uh, bringing it to the modern day. It exudes trauma as one of the characters references at one point. Can you, can you talk about your use of Berlin th throughout the production? Yeah, I mean, you know, for, first of all, I can talk about the production design because I think that's very specific. You know, again, we were talking about, we wanted to see it through Esty's eyes. Um, I don't know if you were already on, Jack, but I sent the rabbi already an article that was written by this, by someone who I guess was his professor at rabbinical school, who's a professor at Dartmouth, a rabbi who's a professor of Jewish studies, because that piece I mean, I couldn't believe it. It's so amazing when you read something where someone gets it. I wanted to actually send him an uh, email, but I couldn't find his email online, but I will find it through through people and I will write to him because um, he understood a lot of, you know, Berlin is not the way it is. I mean, sometimes it is like that, but that's not everything Berlin is, what you see in the show. But we wanted to get to how it feels to her and to how it serves also for her as this realization as, as, a, as a place where she gets to realize that she's not as weird as she thinks she is because other people have these experiences too. And you know, a very important character was the Israeli, secular Israeli woman that she meets uh, who understands who she is, you know, and understands that they're both Jewish, but under, also understands that she, meaning Esti, has been raised to believe that no one is Jewish if they're not Satmar, you know, or not Hasidic. So there's this kind of dialogue between them about Berlin, you know, like, and you see Esty kind of understanding, oh, this isn't just our story, this is other people's story too. You know, this, this, it wasn't just, well, you should read the piece if you're interested in this particular issue because he, he expresses it much better than I am. But we wanted Berlin to be this place where she realizes all kinds of things about herself. That when she returns to the origin of her community's trauma, in order to free herself. But also, it's this place where she sort of encounters the world. And, um, oh, the, sorry, the article someone's asking was in the LA Review of Books, and I sent I, the link to the, the rabbi, link. and he, he can, yes. he can uh, share it with I, I post I posted it again, and he and I will post it again. So that's taken care um, of. And, um, yeah, so, we, when we set out to do the pro production design, it was really important to us to, um, that, that it, well, of course, that it'd be visually different enough from Brooklyn that you knew when you were in Berlin and when you were in, in uh, Brooklyn. But also we chose locations that were sort of, had nonlinear architecture. We chose a kind of pastel, brightly lit color palette. We wanted it to be expressionistic in that sense that you feel like she's kind of seeing the world in technicolor for the first time. Um, and then when her husband follows her to Berlin, you know, we shot in some really special locations. For example, uh, we went, we were the first operation that ever had the chance to shoot in the Weissensee Cemetery, which is the Jewish cemetery in East Berlin. That's just this amazing, I mean, if you're ever in Berlin, you have to go visit it. Um, it's you see it in the show because uh, Yankee and Moisha go there to look for a particular rabbi's grave, and um, it's just this incredibly overgrown, beautiful place, full of Jewish graves. You know, it's it's just you can't even believe it survived the war. It's this amazing place, um, and it was behind the wall, so people didn't get to go there until you know thirty years ago. And but that was also why it was preserved, and it's it's just very special. So we got to shoot there. Um, you know, we wanted to use, without hitting you over the head with it, we wanted to acknowledge the history. You know, it's not random. You know, she's not in Rome, right? She's in Berlin. And that matters. So we, you know, we, uh, there's a scene in the first episode, if you, I don't know, maybe some of you haven't seen it yet, but you will, maybe you'll watch it after, uh, where they go to Wannsee, which is a lake in Berlin. Um, it's like a real lake. It's a huge lake. It's very beautiful. But it's also where the Wannsee Conference took place, which is where the Nazis decided to exterminate the Jews in the camps. And, I, you know, of course, some of these things come from when I first got here, because, you know, the first time you understand that these are real places, 
it, it's it's amazing. You know, you're like, wait, 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 wait. Bonze is a real lake. <laughs> I mean, of course, you know that intellectually. Or I'd never thought about it because these places are just part of what you what I had learned about the Holocaust prior to ever coming to this country or to the city. So there, I had many moments like that in my first year or two in Berlin where it suddenly dawned on me that this is like a real place, you know, real people lived here, real people used this, whatever it was. Um, and so we wanted her to have that series of discoveries and to, for that to be part of her kind of the world beginning to kind of crack open to her uh, and understand how things are connected. I want to pivot for a moment to uh, Shira Haas. Uh, you mentioned her earlier, of course. Um, a lot of us saw her for the first time in Stiesel. Um, what is she like to work with? Magic. And, 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 and <laughs> you know, a lot of us know what makes her work for us as viewers, but for you as somebody working with her, what makes her so special uh, as an actress? How would you articulate it? I mean, okay, so what's interesting with Stiesel is it came on Netflix in 2018, but it was shot in 2013, I think. So this only matters because she was much younger when she was in it. it, it I think people think that it was shot in 2018, but it was shot a long time ago. So in Stizel, she plays a child, actually. I mean, the first season was shot in 2013 and she's literally playing a 12 year old or something, or maybe a 13 year old. And then she of course gets married in the second season. Um, so that was shot a little bit later, but you know, Shira is this just unbelievable person. <clears throat> it's not, it's not just that she's an incredible actress. She's, she's very smart. She's very deep and she's had, she has incredible strength. And when we were casting the show, you know, we were looking for somebody who could believably be a kind of child bride. I mean, let's say under, you know, she's 17, 18 in the show, 19. She has to play a range of ages in the show. Um, but you have to believe also that she has this inner strength to survive this, this, re, this kind of reinvention and, and to, to get this, to have, make this happen. And it wasn't easy to find that combination in, in, in fact, you know, all of us, you know, me, the director, Alexa, um, just everybody, when we saw her audition, we were like, that's it. She's the only one. And we didn't show any other actress to Netflix. So we were basically like, either you, either we work with her or we don't make this show for another six months because I don't know where we're going to find someone else. Like she was so great. And, you know, I could also send you, if you're interested, her audition. Uh, because her audition, um, we, uh, the other thing is we needed someone who could sing. <laughs> which we were asking a lot of this person, this young woman. And um, her audition at which she sang uh, Hallelujah by Leonard Cohen is so good. I mean, not, it was like, not only is she just this incredible actress, but she, and that she can play younger and older and, and, and fragile and strong and all of these things at the same time. I mean, we always joke that she has two things going on on her face at all times. Like she's simultaneously playing two emotions. She's so skilled um, and hardworking. She learned all the Yiddish phonetically um, and she learned it well enough that she could play with it, you know, that she wanted to be able to be spontaneous in her performance. Um, but the, we also, she also sang all of it herself. So if you get to the end of the show and you see her singing this wedding song that's, you know, that you see in episode two and then she sings it, kind of owns it in episode four. So, and many people have asked on, on social media if she was overdubbed. And so then we released um, her audition tape because we wanted everyone to know that she did the singing herself. So I can, I can send that to, uh, to Holly and she can share that. Because well, I, I, Anna, I actually so watched hard. it the other day. Um, it's online. So um, one of us will pull it right now and post it to everybody in the chat box. Um, it, it, it is phenomenal. Um, one of our attendees actually sent in a question, Anna, about costumes and how yeah. did the costume team determine the wardrobe? And are these outfits Esther actually wore or inspired by what we know of the community? And also like they're, you did mention the They're just costume. inspired. Weirdly, we've gotten so much stuff online about how it looks really Prada. <laughs> <laughs> that was the furthest thought from our minds at the time. I mean, it's amazing. Justine, our costume designer, is incredibly 
experienced and skilled at making people look um, like they're wearing their real clothes. She has, she has, she did another show recently called Messiah, where she had to cast, she had, she had to dress like a thousand people. Um, our show was smaller, of course, um, but she sourced a lot of the clothing from uh, used clothing shops and um, um, Goodwill, places like that. Also modest clothing stores from the Turkish community in Berlin, because we were in Berlin. Um, and then, I mean, I'm talking about the women. She sewed a lot of the things for the women herself, um, uh, especially the turbans, which she made herself. Um, she would buy things on eBay and then remake them. I mean, she, she's just so talented. Um, and if you, there, at the end of the show on Netflix, there's a 20 minute making of documentary. And um, you can see kind of everybody involved in the documentary, which is fun. And, uh, and there's quite a bit about the costume in there, but she, um, the, the, our biggest challenge was, was the men's costumes, the men's clothes, because um, traditional clothing is very hard to come by and it's also would be very difficult to sew from scratch. So uh, she bought most of that in Williamsburg. Um, on a couple of research trips uh, where she was in clothing stores and got to look and touch and feel and talk to people and, um, and, and then also ended up purchasing a bunch of stuff. But I the one that. big thing is that we made the strimals and that there, we, we kind of, I think we tell that story in the making of, but the strimals are really expensive and they involve a lot of fur and um, there's six minks in every hat. And it's, I guess, suppose for some people that's worth it if they're going to wear it their whole life, but we were not about to, um, um, we just didn't think that was worth it at all. So we um, actually, the Deutsche Schauspielhaus, which is the big um, theater in Hamburg, where actually our director, who's also an actress, she is an actress in that theater. And so the, the costume department there made us all the strimals. Uh, from scratch with fake fur. And then we had to rent a large truck to bring them all to Berlin from Hamburg, which was, I mean, it, the Strimals were almost like their own character on this show because it was so challenging. And um, we had, we needed really a lot of them. So we, uh, that was a big project. Um, but the rest of the stuff, you know, it's a, it's a lot of high and low, you know, some things are really expensive and special and some things you some for some reason somebody managed to find this like amazing thing at a used clothing store and then um, also sometimes people donated things and some of the extras brought things to the fittings that they thought might be appropriate and um, we ended up using them so um, and then but things like the tights you know there's these special thick tights that they wear with the line down the back and uh, we we bought all those in in Williamsburg. So Anna, I think at this point, we're gonna to start to go to some of the questions in the chat. And uh, I wanna start with um, two questions that just came in about audience reaction. Uh, one from Allison Gilbert and another from Jeff and Nina Kravitz. They basically are asking about reaction in the Orthodox or Hasidic community. Um, okay, so first of all, at least the community that the show is about are not allowed to watch television. So, it, officially they didn't watch it but unofficially because we have our ears to the ground and quite a few people involved in the in the show are also connected to the community I think quite a few people actually watched it anyway and um, we let's just say I think that there's a part of part of them that likes it I, I don't want to speak for other people, but we haven't got, we've gotten some really amazing notes from people. I mean, like we have a WhatsApp chat with the actors and um, where we share the responses uh, from, and we, you know, all of us have received just unbelievable email and, you know, also on Twitter and stuff like that from from people that that is so moving about how they what they how they feel about it. So I, I'm sure I can't generalize. You know, Ellie's mom said that she thought he looked better as a Hasid because he's dressed as a rabbi in the show, and she was like, you know, you used to look so much better than you do now. Okay, uh, she still lives in the community, of course. 
um, she, but she did also say that um, she, she turned it off right away because she didn't like the nudity, but the nudity is in episode two. So we felt that maybe she had watched, you know, that's Ellie's mom, right? Um, the, I think, you know, I can only speak to the reactions that I've received personally, right? And that which have been very, very touching. So we've got a number of questions in the chat about uh, the potential for a sequel. And, and in part, I think it's important for you to know as a creator that we've all been sort of conditioned to second season of Stiesel, third season of, of Ozark. Mm -hmm. but, but before there were these uh, streaming shows, there were, of course, miniseries. Um, so in terms of managing expectations for those of us on the call, and I hate to ask the question, but uh, is this, is it one and done, as it were? It's one and done. This is a mini series. Um, we have all kinds of fantasy fiction about future seasons, but we didn't set it up like that. You know, we weren't, we were just not thinking in those terms. I think we really milked the book in a way for this high drama. We wanted each episode to be really action packed and feel like a lot was happening. And, um, and you know, sometimes it's like this beautiful gem as it is, you know? So we just, that's it. for now, that's it. And we, I mean, there are all kinds of spin-off ideas that have come out of this project, you know, like among, I mean, first of all, a whole community grew up around the project with the actors. Deborah got to know the actors really well. A lot of people became really close friends. You know, there was a real sense of community. Um, you know, I always say that it takes a village to make a TV show and this one really took a shtetl. And it was just an amazing thing to be part of this like diaspora group of, of Jewish people from all over the world. It was so, everybody's experience, relationship to being Jewish, but also relationship to the history, to the sort of collective history to the world was, was very different. And there was such a rich dialogue on set and it was really very great. So I imagine that I will, and they will, that there will be a lot of projects that come out of this um, among, you know, from this kind of group experience. And, uh, you know, we have a lot of, one idea that Alexa and I are still playing with is, is uh, doing a show about the DP camps. Um, you know, no one's really done 45 from that point of view. And we always think of it as like, you know, there's all these shows that are about, you know, young people coming home after like some fake apocalypse in the future, these science fiction shows, but that's how we see what happened to all these young people who came out of Auschwitz and go home to Budapest or wherever and everybody's gone. And all of a sudden you have all these young people who are like, we have to rebuild the world from scratch. And that's like a real thing that happened. And we find that a really interesting area, um, which of course relates to Bobby's story. Uh, the Bobby on the show of Bobby and Sadie, but um, it also relates to Alexa's uh, documentary. If you if you watch it, um, so you know that's just I'm just giving you one example of a project that we've been kind of turning around, um, and but you know there's all kinds of amazing stories to tell about this community. My goodness, it's like you know. Well, once somebody suggested something actually funny, which I can just tell you, a fan, that, that she had it somehow understood that the Kala, te the Kala teacher, the woman who's teaching her how to be, how to be a wife, um, was uh, Moisha's estranged wife and also the daughter of the rabbi. And the reason the rabbi was so interested in rehabilitating Moisha was to kind of bring him back into the community to reconnect with his wife. Now, this was not something that we ever understood, but that's the kind of thing you get from, from the fans, which is very interesting. So uh, back to the chat for another question. Um, arguably, among the most powerful uh, scenes in the series for many of us is the moment when uh, Esty wades into the lake. Um, she loses her wig. Uh, she's been told that across the lake is a villa where uh, aspects of the Holocaust were planned. Um, mm -hmm. All of that is a setup for a question uh, from Amy. Uh, was her dip in the lake in Berlin, was it symbolic of a mikvah, mikvah. a baptism, or just freedom? Mikvah and freedom. 
<laughs> Baptism never occurred to us, although other people have said that, to which we say everything in Christianity comes out of Judaism anyway. So, okay. I, that had never occurred to us. But I will say that, that I have noticed that people describe it as baptismal. And of course, we were referencing mikvah because, you know, the whole idea on the road, there is a different Torah. You know, of course, if there's no mikvah, there are, then, then people use bodies of water. So that, so that, no, we never thought of baptism. It's weird. It's funny how things get just filtered through other cultures, you know, because that never, never occurred to us. Would it occur to you? <laughs> I, mean, I, I can't say it had occurred to me, but if it occurred yeah. to our, uh, one of the participants, I suspect she's probably not alone. Well, she might, uh, have also she might have also read it because I think that, you know, let's say the majority of the world is Christian or, or at least in the, it's, it was funny because that came up early on and we were like, baptism, huh? Like we just hadn't thought of it like that because mikvah is also about cleansing, so. So we've got a question about uh, Esti auditioning for the conservatory um, and the, the, how that sort of came to be an element uh, in the series and inspired in any way by uh, Deborah's experience or, or completely no. fictional? Totally fictional and it's inspired by um, um, a school in Berlin that was started by Daniel Barenboim, who is a uh, Israeli, you know who he is? He's a really famous opera conductor and he's Israeli, he lives in Berlin and he's um, like, he's one of the most famous opera conductors in the world. And he started this school in Berlin called the Berenboim Said Academy. That is incredible. And if you're ever in Berlin, you have to go to a concert there. Uh, Frank Geary designed the concert hall and it's amazing. And it's a school um, where uh, Jews and Muslims play classical music together. So uh, there are students from all over the world um, from who are, well, Arabs and Jews. Some of them are also Coptic Christians, um, but it's, it's kind of a Middle East utopia project that could only exist in Berlin. And it's, it's right in the middle of the city. And um, it's, they basically, we wanted to, we modeled the school on that school because it was something we all, we thought was so uniquely Berlin, you know, that these kids you would never meet otherwise and they would never, and also it's this, you know, crazy post-colonial conundrum. Like why are they even playing European music at all? If they're from the Middle East, you know, there's all kinds of layers of craziness about it that makes it very special. And, um, yeah, so, so we loved the idea of incorporating the idea of that school into the show. So that's, we also decided to make her um, a musician rather than a writer, in part because we're writers and we know it's boring to look at, but also because um, music is such an incredibly important part of Hasidic culture, of Jewish culture in general, obviously, but, but especially, um, you know, in, in the, the more, uh, let's say Orthodox you are, the more you can sing all the prayers and everything. And it's, it's such a profoundly musical environment in a way. But the fact that um, women can, in, in Satmar, that Satmar women can't sing in public was something that we found really resonant with the idea of finding her voice, so. Here's a really interesting question that I, I was asked actually before this conversation from Rochelle. What is Deborah's life like now? Just, I would say Deborah's a really amazing life. Mm -hmm. She's the mother of a 13-year-old son. She um, is, is writing a novel. She lives um, in a beautiful, like, very cozy apartment. She's really a survivor. You know, she has really good friends. She's, I mean, I think one of the things that is in the show, but is true about Deborah, is it's not you know, leaving that community is not a wholesale rejection of that community. It's not, it's not as simple as that. These things aren't black and white. Um, she has, she, you know, I, she could be a rabbi. I mean, she knows so much about everything. She's just the most sort of philosophically deep person to talk to about all kinds of things and especially about Judaism. So she, I would not say that she's run away from her culture. You know, it's just that she couldn't find a way to live in that community. So that's, um, and she has a very good relationship with her son's father also. So that, you know, 
let's say things worked out, right? And it wasn't easy, but 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 things have worked out for her. So a uh, question, um, can you talk about the decision uh, to have Yankel cut his payas? Well, I guess to us, it felt like it was the ultimate sacrifice. I mean, I cry every time I watch that scene, and I, you know, wrote it and, <laughs> you know what I mean? I, I, I think Meat's performance is just so amazing. But it's, it's just that he, he actually, he, he loves her and he's, he screwed the whole thing up, but not because he's a bad person, but because he just didn't know any better, you know? I mean, I don't think, it's, it's not just Etsy who doesn't know a lot of herself and her life. He doesn't know much either, you know? There, there are these two young people who, you know, come to this thing with a lot of optimism and feeling for one another, and it just goes terribly wrong. And they're not... Uh, equipped really to to fix it and I think you know it's the show is not just a journey of of her self-discovery it's also his self-discovery and um he's he hasn't even ever been taught to consider how she feels you know he's he's in this you know his arc is is understanding like trying to understand what's happening you know and understand it from her perspective which he hadn't really considered before um, so, uh, you know, it seemed to us like the ultimate, what else could he do to show her how much he wants to make it work, you know? And it's super painful for him. It's, it is the ultimate sacrifice for him because I don't think that he's someone who wants to leave. So that's, um, you know, that was, we felt that there was no other way. It had to culminate in that, you know, that seemed natural to us. So uh, another question about Berlin, uh, this one more personal for you. Uh, is there a large Jewish community in Berlin now and do you experience anti-Semitism? Um, I do not experience anti-Semitism. Um, I think that there was a time early in my experience where I experienced a kind of what I would call philo-Semitism, which is to say people were like, extremely interested uh, in a way that felt weird. You know, if you come from an environment where everybody's Jewish, it is weird when you end up in, a, I mean, I'm sure all of you have experienced this. And then if you're in a place where people don't know anything about it, but then they're really curious, that can also feel a little strange, right? Even, even if it's all meant in a really positive way. But yeah, there's a, there's a big Jewish community. It's very, uh, there's a wide range. You know, there's Chabad, there's, there's uh, the, the sort of establishment Jewish community in Berlin. Um, I have um, a friend from college who runs the Lauder Foundation, which is a um, kind of, I guess, modern Orthodox, I'm not sure they would call themselves that, but Orthodox, and they are modern, and they are Orthodox. I don't want to speak for them. It's an organization that, um, that, re that restores synagogues in uh, Eastern Europe and um, kind of revives community. And uh, he, we went to Columbia together, and uh, he and his wife are friends of mine, um, and they live a very different life from from my life. But we are, but I love them. So I would say there's a really wide range of uh, Jewish experience in the city. You know, from and then there's tons of Israelis. I mean, who are I love Israelis. So they, there's a lot of um, Israeli culture here too. Ali, I know um, you were keeping an eye on some of the questions related to mother-daughter relationship in the piece. Do you want to tee up the next question? Yeah, a lot of people are actually asking about the mother-daughter relationship and mm -hmm. how it's, if it's improved actually since this, um, since the book was written and since the story has been told. Um, can you talk about the whole mother-daughter relationship? You know, what I have to say is that we made up the mother-daughter relationship in the, in the, um, show. Um, we we stayed true to certain details about Deborah's experience, which is to say that her mother left when she was young, her mother is gay, and um, uh, and her mother and she received German citizenship through her mother's family. But we but the rest of it, everything about their reconciliation and their relationship we made up. We I didn't actually want that's not in the book and I didn't want, you know, at that point we were already making things up. 
so we felt again we st we stay true to the spirit of it but we made up the the actual dynamic but it, it is true that her mother left before and that you know she didn't have the strength to take her she tried to take her with her but but it didn't work out you know and i think one of the things that's just so incredible about deborah and you really feel it when you're with her and it's something i admire about her so much is that she her son was just the most important thing and there was just she managed in circumstances that were not easy to um and she's an amazing mother and her, her son who i love is I mean, he's just like a great kid you know and he's so cool about it all like he was on set when we were shooting the wedding and i was like isaac like does this make you uncomfortable and he's like nah it's just like my grandmother's house <laughs> like, okay he was just like whatever like he's just lived this his whole life he's he's gone back and forth like he was very he's really smart and um he goes to school like i said with my kids and he's you know he's just a great somehow you know this is this is his parents three and he's not by it. he knows this is who he is so she's done a very good job um, so well um, it looks go ahead jack oh no i'm sorry i was just going to say that uh we uh we're keeping an eye on the clock and and we know all of you have things to do today and i'm sure we could go for another hour on this but but before i throw to holly to close um, all of you as participants have been very patient with us on the technology in terms of uh, your cameras, but it, let's take a moment if everybody could turn their cameras on uh, so that Anna can see you and, uh, and see our community here this morning. Uh, thank you. Yeah, that would be fun. It's, uh, it's nice to see uh, many familiar faces from Westchester Jewish Center, but I can also tell you many faces that are not from Westchester Jewish Center, which is very exciting to us at WJC who are fans of Holly's programming for us uh, to see uh, the wide appeal. Holly, I'm gonna throw to you. Uh, well, I don't know. I don't even know how to thank Anna because she's, she's in Berlin and we're so lucky that you've been with us this morning. Um, I also want to thank Jack and Katie, Katie and the rabbi, of course, and everyone at WJC who helped put this together. And so just a reminder, we will send a link out later. You can all share it with your friends, your family. Um, I probably a lot more people will be watching this conversation, I'm sure. And I hope that you all, like Jack said, look for more conversation like this from us. Um, we will be featuring more and hosting more. Uh, why are you here? We will be featuring more conversations um, about pop culture and where it intersects with Judaism and, and Jewish life. And actually tomorrow night, um, we, WJC is hosting a sisterhood event, which is a talk back with the playwright Brian Halperin about his play, The Hairy Man at 7.30 PM. So you can have even more pop culture tomorrow. And again, thank you, Anna, so much. And thank you to everyone for joining us this morning. Thank you for watching Unorthodox Tell all your friends to watch Unorthodox on Netflix. <laughs> and as I told Anna before, I am a fan. I'll be watching and reading anything that you produce in the future. So um, again, thank you so much, everyone. If you want to give her a have applause. Thank you, Holly. Thank you so much. Applause is like this. Bye-bye. Thank Bye -bye. you, Holly. Bye -bye. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. One so last point. Everything you. in the chat will disappear thank when you, we log out. Thank so if you want to capture any URLs or any links that we provided, now is a really good time to do that. Go into the chat section and grab some of these interesting articles that we posted. Interesting.